Hey Adobe, welcome online. I am so glad that you are with us. Uh, listen, I'm gonna try and uh, cut this, uh, do it, go, I'm gonna preach a little faster. Um, the average watch time is like 16, 17 minutes, and so I'm gonna see if I can sneak it in for those of you who are either watching on one and a half uh, speed or, or only watching the first or second half of the message. So we're gonna jump right in to our series on the life of Elijah. I do want to encourage you, if you're local, you should be in the building. We've had some great weeks uh, the last few weeks here in the church. I feel like we're having an encounter with God, and uh, and I like it. And so I'd encourage you to be here if you can. And I don't know if it's going to be an every week thing where God just shows up, if it's every now and then, but I know that our God is a supernatural God, and He shows up in our life in supernatural ways. And so um, so I want to start by saying, if you think being a, a Christian or being a person who follows Jesus is boring, then you have totally missed out on all that God has for you. Uh, my life has been so much more exciting since knowing Jesus than anything I ever did before. Um, and so I just want to encourage you, right? Our God does miracles. And we're looking at this life of Elijah and, and the fire or the presence of God is is our focus. And last week, we started this look, and uh, and we saw that God has sent Elijah away for a time of cutting down in this season, and, and he's becoming dependent on God for everything, and God sends him to this widow and her son who are about to die from starvation, and he does a miracle. He provides supernatural, miraculous oil and flour so that they can continue eating until the drought ends, and so you don't need me to tell you, but I will, right? God wants to meet your needs. Uh, he wants you to depend on him. And when you do, he will show up in miraculous ways to supply all of your needs. Um, and, and so even sometimes he'll do things you don't need, uh, and he'll just show off and bless you to, to remind us that he's God and he cares about us. And so, uh, so you know, I was worried a, a little bit back in the past, um, when I started a, a church that we planted before, uh, man, we were going hard and, and I'd preached almost every Sunday for two years and I was running a little dry and it wasn't in the budget at the time for us to take a vacation uh, other than visiting family, which isn't super vacation for resting anyway. And, um, and, and so, so we needed a little break. We needed a real vacation and uh, and we were inviting a guest speaker to come, and I remember like we were planning to have him come be there for church, and and uh, and he said, hey, what I want to do for you and Amanda is pay for you guys to go to Monterey for two nights, and don't worry about Sunday, I'll take care of it, go have a real vacation, and he gave me spending money and food money on this vacation. All it cost us was the price of gas, which back then, thank God, was, you know, three dollars, and change or something and the that and that was a really low expense and so we were super blessed uh for that vacation and and it was the thing we needed right and and so god provided that from from someone and and so god will supply your needs even sometimes uh right your 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 wants right he'll supply our needs sometimes he'll give us our wants because he's an awesome god who can and does show off his incredible nature. And so uh, so I want to ask you, have you ever needed something from God? Maybe right now there's something that you need from God, and, and maybe there's been something in the past you needed from God, and instead he blew your mind by providing so much more above and beyond than you ever could have imagined. That's where we're at, our first, first Kings chapter 17. We're going to be in verses 17 to 24. And we're going to finish this chapter and set up an amazing showdown for next week's message that you won't want to miss. And here's what it says. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse and finally died. Then she said to Elijah, oh man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? But Elijah replied, give me your son. And he took the child's body from her arms, carried him upstairs to the room where he was staying, laid the body on the bed, then Elijah cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, why have you brought tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? And he stretched himself out over the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, please let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the life of the child returned and he revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son 
is alive. Then the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure that you are a man of God and the Lord, the Lord speaks truly through you. Have you ever gotten your miracle from God, right? They were starving, they got oil, they got flour. Have you ever got your miracle from God? Has God ever done something incredible in your life only to have it followed up by a huge letdown? Has something happened where you were primed for an even bigger miracle and instead it felt like God didn't show up? And uh, one of my biggest struggles through much of my early ministry years um, if I can share it with you, uh, and, and I, I really held it against God for, for quite a while, um, was that we never had a son. I, I believed that the Lord would provide a son for us, and the amount of prayer and fasting that went in to that, and, and I could share story after story of times where we thought we were, were getting a boy and then, and then didn't, and I love my girls more than anything. Um, but I always wanted a son, and after four times we, we gave God the chance to provide, um, I struggled with believing God for other things because it wasn't provided for in that way. And in the midst of that, we had all these doctors tell Amanda early on that she'd probably have trouble getting pregnant anyways, and uh, let alone having four kids uh, whenever we wanted a pregnancy. And, and so it's a miracle we even have kids. It's a miracle that two of them are even alive. And uh, and then last week we said, your yet is coming. And, and so we, we believe that, that God wants to do the things that we believe he said he's going to do. And, and so in the midst of that, right, there was this yet. It was like, well, uh, in the midst of living miracles of life that I enjoy daily, right, these, these great children, uh, I still had some, some disappointment and struggled with that with the Lord. And this is where we find the widow and Elijah in the text today. Elijah has come. He's saved the day. The family was at its end. They're ready to eat their last meal and then starve to death. And Elijah comes and delivers a miracle of God. And now their stomachs are full and their hearts are filled with faith. And, and the son then gets sick and dies. And it's a major letdown. And the widow's faith is crushed once again. And in fact, she probably wishes she had never received the miracle to, to draw this time out. And this woman had lost her most important thing, the only relationship that mattered to her with her son, and now it was gone, and she's devastated and heartbroken, and she lashes out at Elijah. And <clears throat> verse 18, she says, oh man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? She blames God through Elijah for what has taken place, and she's hurting, and she had her hope restored with the food miracle and her hope crushed with the sun devastation. And I find it interesting that the woman was willing to give Elijah the last of her food when he said, hey, give me uh, some of the oil and flour and, and a miracle is going to take place. She willingly gives the food, but it says Elijah took the dead body from her arms. And there are some things in your life that you are freely willing to give to God, even if it means you will suffer from that loss. She gave her last meal uh, and she was going to suffer because of it if God didn't show up and she was fine with that. And I know some of your hearts who are watching, right? And maybe you can't afford to give to the church or extra to missions, but a missionary comes through and, and you empty your wallet out and you're like, I can't afford to do this, but I'm just so compelled to be generous. And maybe that was your food money for later in the week. And there's things that you're willing to sacrifice in obedience for God because you know, uh, you just know that God shows up. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, it says, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offering and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. So like in Elijah's situation, God says do something, and you do it no matter what the cost of sacrifice is, because obe obedience is the key. And so the widow does that with Elijah. He says, give me the last of your food, and she says, well, we're going to die anyway, so here you go. Um, but now Elijah says, give me the dead body of your son. And we find that she doesn't give the son's body up. He has to take it from her. And this boy is what she loved most in the world. And she could not let him go. So I want to ask you, what in your life have you put ahead of the Lord? What are you not willing to release into his hands 
because maybe it's too painful to let go of? What will it take to, to make God first, finally, over all things, including loved ones, in your life? Because whatever it is, it's dead in your arms, but can be made alive with God. And you say, Pastor, what, what does that even mean? Uh, well, let me ask it to you this way. Do you have a family member that is not following Jesus that you've endlessly tried to convert? Maybe you pray vigorously for them, you debate them, you, you try to share the love of Jesus with them, you send them scriptures, uh, you shout out against their sin. I don't know what your methods are, but, but they still haven't come to Jesus despite all your efforts. When will you understand that nothing you can do will convince them? Romans 1.16 says, It's the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. That loved one is dead, literally, spiritually dead in your arms. And you fight and you try and, and you weep and you call out to God to do something or anything to save your lost loved one. And God, like Elijah, says, give them to me. <laughs> God bless me. We're not even going to cut that out. We're just going to keep going. And so you see what is dead in your arms. God has the power to bring life to. And then it might not be a relationship with a person. It might be a dream for your future, some hope for your life. It might be a goal that you set that nobody knows about that maybe you let die because it doesn't seem like it's going to come to pass. It could be a physical treasure that you want to earn or have lost. It might be a letdown from the past or dead hope for the future. In your arms, that thing is dead, but in God's hands, that thing can be made new again. It can be revived and it can be given new life. The thing that you can't give to God is the thing he wants the most. Idolatry is worshiping anything else above God. That means your spouse, your children, your work, wh whatever it is for you, anything that comes before God is sinful. It's idolatry. And you might say, I don't worship any idols. I pray daily. I read my Bible. I love God. But take, it your, take a look at your calendar, your planner. Take a look at your bank account. See if God's number one in those places. Take a look at, at right your, your speech is the way you talk, is the way you act, no matter who you're with, right? Like, is God number one in those places? And take a look at your thought life. No, no, we're not going to meddle there. I'm not going to go there today. So Elijah, he takes the boy. They go upstairs alone. Elijah cries out to God. He stretches himself over the dead boy's body. And instantly, nothing happens. And he does it a second time. And suddenly, nothing happens. And if the story ended right there, if Elijah had given up after two tries, it probably would have been a decent reflection of your life and mine. Giving up just short of an unrealized miracle. You say, God, I gave you what you asked for. You took from me what you wanted, and now I'm crying out to you for a miracle, and still nothing is happening, and you quit, and I quit, and Elijah could have quit. For me, right, God, you had four chances to give me a son, and I quit. We're done having kids. Maybe you've prayed for breakthrough. You've raised your hand for prayer. Maybe even you gave your life to Jesus and still the miracle you are expecting hasn't come. And, and, and it's, it's hard and we do all we know to do. And Elijah, he condemned the evil king, if you remember from last week, to his face. And he lived and he was fed by ravens supernaturally in the wilderness to survive. And he saw God empty, uh, right, take an empty jar of flour and oil and turn it into food. And now he has this dead body of this young boy and he's crying out to God. And he's laying on the boy's body praying and still there's nothing. Now this dead boy is dead and the fire prophet Elijah can't even do anything except not give up. And so Elijah doesn't give up and finally on the third time he cries out, "Oh Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him." The Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the life of the child returned and he revived. Now, you know what I think is happening here with Elijah and maybe even with you and I, we're praying the wrong kinds of prayers. We've been praying wrong. We're not praying prayers 
of fire. We're praying prayers of tears. Look at this. Verse 20, Elijah cried out to the Lord, why have you brought tragedy to this widow who has opened her home, causing her son to die? Elijah cries out to God and he prays a prayer focused on his broken situation. He's focused on himself and on this widow and on the loss that has taken place and nothing happens. And how often do you and I pray about that? We pray as, as our focus is on our loss. Your prayers are bemoaning the current situation instead of speaking to, to the future of what you believe God wants to do and, and bringing that thing to come to pass through prayer. And Elijah prays like this a few times. Lord, bring back this loss. Lord, bring back this loss. And it isn't until he changes the way he prays that the fire of God, the presence of God shows up inside of him and the situation is altered. The, the first prayer focused on what was at hand, uh, right? Like, here's, here's what we're facing. That's what his focus was on. The second prayer said, oh, Lord, my God, the emphasis is on the Father. Please let this child's life return to him. Future, miracle, God, I need you, and bam. Elijah stops crying about the past, crying about the hopelessness and the brokenness of the present and speaks the future into existence under the anointing of God. And he doesn't ask for an explanation through his tears. He doesn't say, God, why did this happen? He instead proclaims the victory and addresses the Lord. And God sparks something inside of Elijah when he makes this change in his heart and a miracle jumps from Elijah into this boy and God takes the things we won't give him and he resurrects them to be used for his glory if we get the focus off of ourselves and onto his miraculous working power. Your life, your situation is dead in your hands, in your control. And until you release it to God, you may never see the miracle. And when the miracle does come, it may not look like the way you wanted it. And the journey to get there might not have been the path that you expected to take. And sometimes fire burns quickly, loudly, and publicly. Sometimes it's out of control. Sometimes fire is contained and controlled. But it still burns and it still devours and it's still confined and it's still controlled. And Elijah took the boy upstairs and was alone with God and with the broken hopes and dreams that his life contained and of the widow, the hopes and dreams she had for this boy. And, and alone with God, Elijah called out and God stirred fire enough to revive the boy. And I want to give you some time for an upstairs experience. We're not going to make a, a spectacle, right? It, it's not about working ourselves into a frenzy, uh, right? It, it's about seeking the Lord and expecting him to show up and do something in our lives. And so, so when I pray, we're going to end, this feed will end, but I want to encourage you not to end your time having church, maybe put on some worship music, maybe open up your Bible, maybe spend some time alone with the Lord, just calling out to God in your brokenness for you to, to, to hear from heaven, to experience his presence, to, to get that spark. Don't be done with this service when, when I say amen and we turn this off. Like you need to go after God until you feel his presence. And so I want to finish with this one final verse, and then I'm going to let you go. And look, we finished inside 20 minutes. Uh, go online at obcc.org if you want to give digitally. Romans 8.11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give, you, give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. God, I thank you for the one who is watching and I pray that we would be like Elijah, God, that the things in our life that appear dead, that we feel like have been lost, that you would resurrect those things, hopes and dreams within us right now, things we've given up on, God. I pray that we would have a renewed fervor and trust that you're going to do the things you've promised to do. And so, God, I pray that in these coming minutes that we would continue to seek after you, that your presence would speak to us now, God, that you would restore and heal us and anything that we thought the enemy had taken and destroyed and killed, God, that you would bring new life to it right now in the powerful name of Jesus. God, I pray that you'd be with each and every single person, and it's in your name we pray. 
Amen.